Again, my name is Maurice Turner, and I'll be sharing with you some free and low-cost resources to help keep you secure. Now, there's going to be a lot of information that I'm going to present in a relatively short amount of time, but don't worry about having to write it all down. All of these links will be available to you at the end of the presentation. So let's go right to the most important one. It's the telework best practices that's put together by the federal government. This was developed as a toolkit as folks were working from home in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, what I like about this particular resource is that it focuses on the different kinds of workers at an organization, whether it's senior leadership, the IT professionals, or those teleworkers who are now doing their job at home or on the road. The best part about this resource is that it's straight to the point and easy to read. I like that it's geared toward these different kinds of users as a recognition that they all play a different role in keeping their organization safe and secure. Now, while many of us are going back into the office, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the work will continue to be done on the road and away from the offices. So it's more important than ever that these particular steps are taken to make sure that we're as safe as possible moving forward. Next, I wanna talk about this expert roundtable that was hosted by Google. It's a bringing together of digital security experts and campaign experts. The idea behind this roundtable and the importance of sharing this information is that it's a frank discussion of trying to find that balance between security and being able to let folks get their jobs done. I like the fact that it specifically focuses on how work gets done at political campaigns and what that trade-off is and making sure that the work can get done, but also that the folks who are there in those organizations are as secure as possible. Again, the federal government, this time the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has put together a tailored checklist just for campaigns. This checklist is pretty basic. I'm sure you remember some of what Cliff talked about in making sure that these basics are done. And well, the important thing to remember is that these are the basics because they actually work. Not everyone has heard of these before, so it's a good chance to make sure that everyone starts off on the same page about understanding the foundational elements of what it means to be secure within not only election official offices, but campaigns as well. This cybersecurity toolkit is put together by CISA. And again, it's designed to make sure that everyone who's involved with campaigns understands what role they can play. The toolkit is great because it goes step by step to assess the appropriate risk and the corresponding mitigation, whether it's a product or a service or just additional training that can happen within the organization, like an office or a campaign, to make sure that that risk is reduced as much as possible. Now, it's really not going to be possible to be 100% secure. So what the toolkit focuses on is how do you reduce the risk within the budget and the time that you have available to make sure that you are as secure as possible? The U.S. Election Assistance Commission, EAC, also has election security preparedness materials. This material is geared toward election officials. It gets down into the operational details, things like how do you perform self-assessments? What do you do if you're interested in remote voting? Or what are some best practices for conducting audits on elections? Now, even though this is geared toward election officials, it also makes a great educational resource for those in the community and especially journalists who are interested in learning about the operational side of their elections. NAS, the National Association of Secretaries of State, put together this media campaign. It's called Trusted Info 2022. The idea here is that election officials are the trusted source for election information. Now, you're going to hear more about election information sources later on, but the idea here is that staying secure also means making sure that the message is secure, to make sure that the authoritative source of information gets that trusted information out to the audience that it's intended to go to. The Defending Digital Campaigns offers free cybersecurity assistance for House and Senate campaigns. This is a nonpartisan independent offering of free and reduced price products. Now, what I really appreciate about this effort is that they've already gone through the FEC to make sure that this is not treated as in-kind resources. Again, this is just for House and Senate campaigns. 
Now, for other organizations, there's the Global Cyber Alliance. They offer vendor agnostic, standards-based toolkits and resources for elections as well as journalists. For example, this toolkit for journalists goes step-by-step -step to identify risks and corresponding risk mitigation options that are available. I definitely recommend that independent journalists and even small newsrooms go through this toolkit to find out how they can better protect themselves for the risks that they are facing uniquely. The Cyber Readiness Institute is a multi-sector global partnership that provides free starter kits for small and medium-sized businesses. Now, you might be wondering, why am I talking about small and medium-sized businesses when we're supposed to be talking about elections? Well, if you think about it, campaigns are basically small and medium-sized businesses. Now, what I like about this particular resource is that they have posters and conversation guides. This opens up that dialogue between supervisors and staff members about the importance that people play in cybersecurity. So regardless of the products and services that are out there, if the people aren't being committed to staying secure, it's going to be very difficult for the organization to be secure as well. Now, for the most part, cloud-based services are going to be very secure. They're going to be hosted by companies that have put large amounts of resources into making sure that that infrastructure is as well protected as it can be. An example of this is going to be Google. They offer an extra level of protection called their Advanced Protection Program. This is for their customers, like activists, journalists, or even politicians or campaign teams that face unique risks. And so there are extra protections that are available. You can get in touch with Google to find out if you qualify for this free service. Microsoft offers a similar program called Account Guard. This is that extra level of protection for cloud-based services like OneDrive or Office or for email. Again, it's available at no cost and you can contact Microsoft to find out how you can take advantage of this program. Now for everybody else, especially those that are involved on social media platforms, there is Facebook Protect now. This particular program is available to those folks that face heightened risks. And going back to what I said before, making sure that the sources of information about elections are protected and they're seen as being authoritative and authentic. Facebook Protects offers an extra level of protection for those sources like election officials. Twitter recently rolled out their updated guidance for the 2022 midterms. Again, they talk about their efforts in making sure that their accounts on their platform are as protected as possible to help prevent account takeovers and the, dissem the dissemination of misinformation. So when you're looking at an account, you can tell just by the label whether or not it's coming from an authoritative source. As more and more conversations are happening on entertainment platforms like TikTok, it's important to remember that it's also a place that adversaries are looking at to help influence elections. TikTok has additional product features like reporting and guides directly in their app that help educate users about what to be on the lookout for and how to let them know when they come across inauthentic information that needs to be dealt with. I'm gonna run through some other free tools and resources that I like to use when I'm doing my research about elections. One is the Hamilton dashboard. This is an analysis of Chinese and Russian promoted messages on social media platforms that are designed to influence democracies around the world. So if you're a journalist, I definitely recommend that you take a look at it to find out just what these authoritarian regimes are saying about democracies and how they're trying to influence elections. Another place I like to look is factcheck.org. Sometimes I'll come across a story, maybe it's on social media, maybe it's reported in the news, that seems too good to be true. Factcheck.org lets anyone check to find out if it's a true claim or it's a false claim. There's additional research that's been done to help verify the claims that are made by the story. It's a good place to start if you see something that's too good to be true or just doesn't sound right. Another resource that I like to use when it comes to misinformation is CISA and their disinformation posters. 
This is a graphical way of getting across the point that everyone plays a role in the spread or the stopping of the spread of disinformation. Again, it goes back to the people. If you can help get the message across to people, people understand what their role is in keeping systems secure, but also their own network secure and helps to stop the spread of disinformation. There are a number of federal policies that are coming online that help touch on all aspects of elections because elections are actually designated as part of critical infrastructure. So there are a number of additional responsibilities and resources available to the vendors and the networks that play a role within this critical infrastructure system. One that I wanna call your attention to in particular is the idea of good faith research. Good faith research is when researchers, whether it's in the private sector or maybe even from academia, are doing research on network systems and they find a flaw. Now, what's great about this particular process is that it is completely legal and definitely encouraged for those folks to come forward, responsibly disclose those vulnerabilities so that those systems can be patched and they can be made more secure. And you can see here that the Department of Justice also advocates for that kind of a disclosure. So if you have a friendly hacker in your area, I look forward to you being able to reach out to them and build a good relationship so that you know that you have additional help that you may not be aware of. And with that, I'm gonna close out and leave you with this link to all of the resources that you've heard about today and more. Thank you, Adam.